Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Jim Mazzara. Dr. Mazzara did his medical school training at New York Medical College. He then went on to complete an orthopedic residency at St. Luke Roosevelt Hospital, which is a teaching hospital affiliate of Columbia University. Good morning, Dr. Mazzara. Good morning. Dr. Mazzara, what I'd like to discuss over the next few minutes is a, a relatively common problem called tennis elbow. Uh, I think you and I know that is lateral epicondylitis, yes. but that's pain at the outside bump of the elbow that is is almost ubiquitous in the population. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what that what that's all about. Uh, tennis elbow is actually a uh, little micro tear or um, uh, several microscopic tears in the tendon as it attaches to the bone. It's generally the wrist extensor tendon. So one of the wrist extensors as it attaches to the outside bump on the elbow becomes torn as a process of the healing mechanism. There's a great deal of inflammation in the tendon and that inflammation causes pain. The body's in the process of trying to heal this while we are then in the process of continually re-tearing it. And there's a lot of stress on that damaged segment of the tendon until patients finally have this continuous aching pain on the outside of the elbow and very commonly down the forearm to the top of the hand sometimes where they come in and they are locally tender over the tip of the elbow uh, and Initially, it was probably described in individuals who played tennis. In my practice, it's generally seen in individuals who uh, do other kinds of more physically demanding work or even repetitive work, where the tendon is torn either from one large injury or thousands of little injuries, like a repetitive task that they perform routinely for a period of, of months to years you get this inflammatory reaction. You know, it's interesting. I, I try to explain it to patients that I see is, it's one of those injuries that occurs and it's not bad enough to sort of stop what you're doing. You know, if it were bad enough, we would probably rest it or put it in a splint and it would heal up and it would be fine. Yeah. What, what, what I explain normally happens is that it's not bad enough to do that, so we continue to go back. We get up the next day, we injure it again. Finally, the body just gives up and says, okay, if you're not gonna let it heal, I'm just gonna stop trying to heal it. Right. And we see that, um, sort of degeneration that occurs in the tendon and the inflammation and it just stops. It looks like it's not trying to heal anymore. Right, it continually tears and, and re-tears and the, the inflammatory reaction is part of healing but that's really what causes the pain. And because we don't protect it, it, it never has the opportunity to heal. Mm -hmm. Now tell us a little bit about the symptoms. When a patient presents with this or a patient is having pain in the elbow, how do they know they, they may have tennis elbow versus any other pain in the elbow? Well, tennis elbow can certainly hurt when you use it, but it can also hurt when you don't. It tends to hurt a little bit less when you're at rest, but it's a fairly local spot of tenderness. It's over the outside of the elbow on the little bony por portion of the outside of the elbow, and just below that, that's typically where you have your point of maximum tenderness. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also have pain down the arm. At any time you extend the wrist, you tend to have pain. Any time you lift something with your palm down to the ground, you may also have a lot of pain in the outside of the elbow or in the upper form. This particular kind of lifting or task will tend to bother patients as well. You know, it's interesting. I, 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 I'm, I'm a sufferer of tennis elbow in the past myself, and from my memory, some of the worst things that could occur was shaking hands with someone, yep. very painful, True. reaching for a doorknob, especially a car door. If I tried to open a car door, it was immediate pain. And uh, anything, like you say, that's extension like this with gripping tends to, to put those, those tendons on stretch and mm -hmm. anything was just purely uh, murder. Well, in, in addition, sometimes when you just make a fist and lift something heavy, even if your arm isn't extended, mm -hmm. uh, because the, the power that you get out of flexing your, hand, your fingers and making a tight fist involves a lot of stress up here on the outside of the elbow, even that can hurt some patients in more advanced cases. Mm -hmm. When you try to make this diagnosis and try to narrow it down to lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, what do you go through in the office when you see a patient who presents with elbow pain and says, Doc, I think I may have tennis elbow. How do you make that diagnosis? Well, we want their history. We want to make sure that the pain is in the right location on the outside of the elbow. In general, it's, it's not unreasonable for the pain to get referred down towards the wrist. It's a little more uncommon for the pain to go up to the shoulder. Uh, we want to make sure that they don't have any numbness or tingling in the arm. And if they do, we want to examine the neck and the shoulder to make sure that's not the source of the arm pain. A lot of different things can cause arm pain on the outside of the elbow. Uh, tennis elbow is probably the easiest one to diagnose, but there are other things like pinched nerves in the neck or referred pain from the shoulder can go down as far as the elbow as well. You want to examine the joints both above and below the elbow. 
Yeah, it's one other thing that I think we, we as orthopedists always keep in the back of our mind is that one of the nerves, the radial nerve, goes through that area. And yep. there's, there is some, much less likely, but there is a condition called radial tunnel syndrome right. that can affect a similar area. A little different pain um, profile when you start stop to see folks that have it, but it can fool you sometimes. And, and uh, something you might think is tennis elbow actually may be affecting the radial nerve. Well, about 5% of patients will actually have both tennis elbow and radial tunnel syndrome. Radial tunnel, unfortunately, is a little bit more difficult to diagnose. You, you might see patients who have a little pain, discomfort, and sensitivity over the radial nerve. The symptoms may be a little bit different in terms of location, but they're if you have exclusively radial tunnel syndrome, you're not generally going to be very tender over the outside of the elbow where the tendon is, be much more tender over the nerve. Mm -hmm. Now, do you make this diagnosis just based on your physical exam and the history, or do you find imaging, either x-rays, MRI scan, or anything else in terms of test helpful to make this diagnosis? Do you mean for radial tunnel or tennis elbow? Either one, to distinguish the two. Well, this is, aside from clinical diagnosis and examination, sometimes diagnostic injections for radial tunnel, there's no real objective test that's going to prove somebody's got radial tunnel syndrome, and EMG is not going to confirm it. EMG is a nerve conduction test. And in many cases, radial tunnel is more of an irritation of the nerve and is not going to cause any weakness or numbness. And so a nerve test is not necessarily going to give us a definitive diagnosis. In terms of the tennis elbow, however, you can certainly get an MRI. I would say in the majority of cases, I do not. I do an x-ray to make sure that they don't have any arthritis on the outside of the elbow. We look for little associated calcium deposits and bone spurs. I don't necessarily need to do an MRI to, to make a diagnosis of tennis elbow, though. And do you think that the MRI scan is, is helpful in any way uh, in, in special cases? I, I think if somebody's got a potential question as to whether or not it's exclusively tennis elbow or maybe tennis elbow and something else, I may do an MRI. But if I'm convinced that they have tennis elbow, I don't see the MRI as of, of great value. Uh, are there other potential causes for elbow pain in that area? Well, certainly there, you can have arthritis in the elbow joint. You can have a ganglion cyst in that area, and you can certainly have other causes for elbow pain, such as a partial distal biceps tendon ruptures, which can cause similar pain in that part of the arm, a little different location, a little bit different in terms of diagnosis and examination. So if, as I said, somebody comes in, they have a local tenderness, pain on resistance testing, a negative x-ray of the elbow, I don't need an MRI to confirm that that's tennis elbow. So at that point, you're ready to sort of say, I think you have tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis yes. and proceed on with, with treatment at that point. Yes. And how do you start treatment? I mean, is this something that, that is treated conservatively or do I need an operation if I have tennis elbow? Well, some patients eventually need surgery. The vast majority do not. We try to allow the arm to rest. There are two ways to put the tendon at rest. One is called a counterforce brace or a little tennis elbow band or a strap. It's actually worn up here just below the area of the painful tendon. What I find is that patients tend to not apply that properly and, and tends not to be very effective. And my own approach is to put people in a wrist immobilizer. And the purpose of the wrist immobilizer is because that is probably the best, most reliable way to put the ex wrist extensor in a position where it's not going to do any work. You can still move your fingers in the wrist immobilizer, but it puts the tendon at rest by putting the wrist in extension takes all the stress off the elbow. I, f I find that to be a little bit more effective. And then you want to help control pain with anti-inflammatories. There are two approaches to anti-inflammatories, either cortisone injections or oral anti-inflammatories, both of which tend to be very effective. Um, how long do you have patients wear the wrist brace when you use that? Is this something that they're going to need to wear uh, for a prolonged period of time, or is this something that uh, is just a short period of time? No, I generally ask patients to wear it for about three to four weeks, and those people come back, and whether they're given the anti-inflammatory or the cortisone shot doesn't, doesn't really affect how long we immobilize those people. I ask them to wear it as much and as often as they can. You know, take it off if, uh, when you wash your hands, you bathe, and if you have to do something outside of the splint, but otherwise you wear it full time. Mm -hmm. Three weeks later or four weeks later, I see people back and we reassess the elbow. The vast majority of those people are better. Some are experiencing no pain. Those people who have a little bit of pain uh, are still better. And then we go on to the second step in treatment. The second step at that point is to start to rehab the elbow. 
my experience has been if you do the rehab early on, you, you sometimes take that painful tennis elbow and aggravate it and make it worse. So we try to allow for a little healing, control inflammation, and then get people off to physical therapy. And then we take them out of the wrist immobilizer and then put them in the little tennis elbow band that it gives them a little bit more flexibility of the hand and wrist while still protecting the tendon at the elbow. Now, do you always do an injection when you see these folks with acute tennis elbow or, or not? It's an option. I, I offer it to patients. Uh, I, I try to explain to people it, it is the shot itself is not a cure. Everybody knows somebody who had one shot and was better forever and never had a day of pain after that. But I, I don't want to tell patients that a shot of cortisone is the cure. The cortisone or the anti-inflammatory is a way to control inflammation and a way to control pain. If we inject somebody, we're putting the anti-inflammatory in there, but we're also taking the needle and we're, we're actually peppering the tendon. By peppering the tendon, we're traumatizing the tendon on a microscopic level, and by doing so, jump-starting and stimulating the body's healing response once again, allowing the pain mechanism, the pain response, the, um, I'm sorry, the healing response to start over again. And so what we're trying to do is stimulate a little healing of the tendon while we're controlling some of the pain. And so what we'll do is give people the injection, explain to them that in three weeks you might feel better, but your tendon will not be healed. It takes a good six weeks for that tendon to heal, and sometimes longer to rehabilitate it to the point where it doesn't bother you anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, I've noticed that some physical therapists really like to use uh, an alternative steroid delivery system yes. than the injection. And some, some people use ultrasound with a, with a cortisone cream over the area. I think that's called phonophoresis. And then some folks use iontophoresis. Yes. And I think there's some newer things that actually have little battery packs you can put on in it. The, the theory is, is that the electronic charge forces the cortisone molecule, the medication, down into that tendon. Mm -hmm. Have you found this to be equivalent to an injection? Do you see any use for this? Uh, the, we, we begin iontophoresis at the three-week mark, and after the three weeks, after somebody's either had the anti-inflammatory or the cortisone shot and has been immobilized in the wrist immobilizer for that period of time, then they go off to therapy where they do some stretching and strengthening and iontophoresis. At the end of that three-week period of therapy, what I hope they have is a good understanding of the, their injury, the do's and don'ts, their home exercise program and minimal to no pain as they continue to heal their, their damaged, partially torn tendon. Now, if they're successful at healing this without surgery, and, and you mentioned that most people are, how long is this going to take? What do you normally see? Uh, what I generally tell patients is it takes a minimum of six weeks for the tendon to heal if it's going to heal. You have to protect it for at least two to three months, and I would advise patients for at least a full six months after the pain is gone to continue to do some stretching and strengthening and to wear the tennis elbow band for really stressful stuff. So if they're out shoveling snow or doing heavy work, they don't have to wear the band all the time, but that maybe they should wear it during those episodes of increased demand for about six months. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to the small population of patients that don't heal with this conservative treatment. Mm -hmm. When do you make that decision? What tips you off that those patients are going to need surgery? Uh, patients will generally come back and have done therapy. They may be a little bit better, but they're still having some pain. They may come back after several weeks to a couple of months of home exercises, modified activity. They don't seem to be responding. We really try to defer any kind of surgery for at least four to six months. Closer to six months, I think that's, that's been the recommendation. So if we can get somebody to do some exercises, modify their activity, and have good treatment for six months, and they still have pain and symptoms, they become a very good candidate to have surgery to treat that. Statistically, I think if you look at patients who've had tennis elbow for a year, who after a year of good treatment still have pain, those people just don't get better. So somewhere at the six-month mark, they start to be a realistic candidate to have surgery done. Now, tell me a little bit about the surgery to, to uh, uh, repair or treat tennis elbow. Uh, what are you trying to do when you, we, when you suggest to a patient, I think surgery would help you? What are you going to do during that surgery? What we're doing is we're, we're going to make a small, it's a quick general anesthesia or a regional block. It's a small incision of the outside of the elbow. We go down to the damaged segment of the tendon. Now, there's always an area, a very precise area of the tendon that's torn. It's, the, it's the, a portion of the extensor carpi radialis brevis, which attaches to a very precise area in the 
outside of the elbow. And when you go in surgically, you'll always see a damaged area. The tendon doesn't look normal. In more extreme cases, there'll actually be a gap between the tendon and the bone where the tendon is actually just pulled away from the bone. And those are significant cases. Tend to do, all of those tend to do very well with surgery. What we do is we go in and we excise the damaged piece of the tendon. And then we take a little motorized burr and we burr up the outside surface of the bone. What that does is that stimulates some bleeding into this little area, this little defect that we've created surgically. And in that blood are the stem cells that then differentiate into a new tendon attachment. My own approach is right after surgery, two days after surgery, take off the dressing. You have my okay to do anything and everything you want with the elbow, pain permitting. What I've found is that people who get to use the elbow sooner, immediately after surgery, do much better than those patients who were immobilized and protected for a week or two. Years ago, what I did was I did protect the patient for a couple of 10 to 14 days after surgery in a splint and then start therapy. Those people would eventually get better but took much longer. What I've found is if, if you're in there and you're taking out the damaged segment of the tendon, get those people moving faster, no restrictions, they can go out and do whatever they want 48 hours after surgery. Those people do better, faster, with a more reliable degree of pain relief sometimes at about the two to three month mark where they could do just about anything they want to do at that point. Now explain to me what you think is happening when you go in to do this operation and you open up that tendon, excise that area of abnormal tendon and burr that bone down. What are you trying to accomplish as a surgeon? Well what we're doing is removing the inflamed damage segment of the tendon. Uh, and what we're trying to do when we burr the surface of the bone down is to create an avenue for new circulation, new blood to come into that damaged segment of the tendon. And in that blood from the patient's own system are the stem cells that will heal the tendon. And the stem cells will fill in that little area with a tiny little blood clot. And through use, through normal activity, the elbow tendon is stressed and strained in such a way where there are little signals is exchanged between the new stem cells and the adjacent cells that tell the new stem cells that they need to become strong, flexible, dur durable tendon cells. So the more you use those, that tendon, the more normally you use the elbow, the more likely you are to get a good outcome, a good flexible tendon, and a, and a pain-free joint. So your feeling in the post-operative course is that rather than immobilize that elbow to allow this to heal. Your experience is that the faster patients begin to use their elbow, the faster that process occurs. Absolutely, I encourage people to take off the dressing at 48 hours and do anything and everything they can tolerate right after the surgery with no limitations. If they wanna go out and cut the lawn and shovel snow, if, they can, if they're not having post-op pain that prevents them from doing that, they have my blessing to do so. Uh, one other question. That, th this procedure today is done with a block. It's an outpatient procedure, I'm assuming. This is not something you have to stay in the hospital for. No, it's an outpatient procedure. It's either a quick general anesthesia or a nerve block, a regional block that puts your arm to sleep. sleep. It actually takes about 15 minutes to do. It's a very straightforward process. How long do you think it takes for a patient to recover after this operation? Uh, when do you see them completely normal where they've forgotten they had this problem? That's probably going to be closer to four to six months, although people at the two and three month mark will come back and say, I, I feel great, I have no pain and discomfort. That's a great number of patients, but I'm a little hesitant to say that at three months out of a tennis elbow release they can do anything they want. And I would tell you it's probably not until they're about four to six months where I can say, go ahead, do whatever you want. Okay. Um, Let's move on to, to potential complications. This seems like a relatively simple operation mm -hmm. that's done as an outpatient and is done through a very small incision. Um, what are some of the complications you worry about as an orthopedic surgeon when you perform this operation? Um, nerve damage is always a concern, but in this part of the elbow, there is only a small sensory branch of a nerve, and we're always able to avoid that nerve bleeding uh, potentially into the area. We actually need some bleeding to get the healing process to occur. So bleeding is generally not excessive. Infection is always potential risk. And as I mentioned earlier, we always uh, like to think that our patients are going to get a perfect result every time we operate on them. And the success rate of this operation is 80 to 90% of the time it works very well and people come back with no pain. 
There's a very small number of patients, however, who may have other pathology, and that's a little bit more unusual, and that's generally something that perhaps wasn't initially thought of at the time of the initial evaluation. People will potentially have ligament injuries or arthritis in the joint that can affect their eventual outcome. Those are things that need to be treated a little differently, but if we're talking about exclusively tennis elbow surgery or lateral epicondylitis, it's the, really the nerve damage, bleeding, infection risks that we are most concerned about. So if, if, if that patient comes back and they've been out of surgery four to six months, you're going to start at least thinking in the back of your mind, have I missed something? Should I be looking for something else? Should I do some more testing to see if one of these other problems is going on? Yeah, and, and that's when we may do an MRI. Uh, we may do something else to evaluate the elbow. But in, in most of those cases, we come back and just say, this is one of those unusual cases where for reasons that we don't fully have an answer for, patients just didn't get better. Mm -hmm. Many of those cases are actually in individuals who may have been a little hesitant or may not have healed very well from the very beginning. They may have been one of those individuals who's a little reluctant to go out, to go out and use the arm. And so they've healed the tendon, but it's not flexible, durable, and strong enough to do what they wanted to do. So they end up tearing it again. And some of those people end up benefiting from another surgery. I've had the opportunity to see patients who've come in from other practices who've had continued pain following a tennis elbow release. And it looks to me like they had a good treatment initially. And those individuals came to me. I operated on them after their failed previous surgery. I quite honestly don't think I did anything different or better than the previous orthopedic surgeon did, but somehow they get better. And I don't think I have a good answer as to why. Maybe it's the post-op course, maybe it's a more aggressive approach to therapy, but it looks like the, those individuals that I'm thinking of had good treatment initially, and for reasons that just aren't really clear, they, they never got the kind of pain relief they were hoping for. Well, I think you probably answered my next question, but one of the questions I would have is, are these people at risk over a long period of time? If, if I've had tennis elbow uh, at one time in my life, am I more prone to develop this later on, or once you've had that operation, am I pretty much healed and, and should not expect another problem with it? Well, look, we're, we're treating the condition, we're getting it to heal, but we're not making you indestructible. So can you re-tear it at a future point? The answer is yes. You can always sustain a future injury to the tendon. It may continue to bother you over a period of time. So what we're doing is, is treating the injury as it is, but to assure a patient that you'll never have this again is, is unrealistic. Okay. Well, let me summarize our discussion up to this point. It's, it sounds like it's been a, a pretty comprehensive discussion of a, a very common problem. What I heard you say is that one is that, is that tennis elbow is very common and it, it, it occurs in a lot of folks and the vast majority of people are easily treated with conservative means, that they're never going to need an operation. That's correct. But if they don't get better with a relatively simple conservative treatment plan, there's good solid operate there is a good solid operation that uh, works pretty effectively and is successful in the vast majority of the cases correct um, excellent discussion thanks, thanks for helping us with this and uh, uh, i look forward to any future discussions thank you very much